Yellow police tape covered all the classrooms, including ours in a little plaza outside the anthropology department in Southwestern College. And for a split second that crisp October day in 2014, I had to confront the possibility that my life was about to exit the pedestrian bland lane and take the Cronenberg body horror off-ramp into uncharted horror movie territories. I was about to take a nosedive into a psychological thriller of existential proportions. Chula Vista was about to be ground zero for apocalyptic catastrophe, and here I was, like Forrest Gump, to experience firsthand the first death blows to human society. What seemed like a normal end of class ended up being one of the most bizarre incidents in recent South Bay memory as we walked out and noticed yellow police tape blocking us from the rest of the campus. And over the course of that afternoon, in the fall of 2014, slowly the rumors and hysteria crept like some airborne pathogen into our sealed off quarantined no man's land. It was my biological anthropology class at Southwestern Community College that fall semester, so two days a week I would walk in and sleep through lectures I can only imagine contained the secrets of all creation and the very nature of humankind. I was surprised the teacher, a PhD, an expert on everything, would waste her time going over slides about taxonomic classification to a tired class of hungover part-time law employees slash psych majors, but... I would occasionally wake up during a fun video about gorillas, so naturally I didn't ask too many questions. <laughs> Overall, the semester was like any one of the 10 others I spent there. It was going relatively fine, slowly knocking off prereqs for whatever expensive film school in LA I felt like transferring to that week. And despite my sleep habits, I wasn't even doing half bad in bioanthro. I didn't hate the class after all. But keep in mind, this is fall 2014, and if you don't recall, that was an era dominated by a particular fear, a fear of Ebola. Before our detention, class had started off normal enough, though naturally at the time, Ebola was a big topic, especially given the biological and anthropological nature of this class. In what sounded overly paranoid at the time, our class overachiever interrogated our biologically professor biologically savvy professor for any information that might be helpful for survival and our professor offered up calm reasonable explanations about why we shouldn't panic about extinction just yet <laughs> this overachiever hovered near my deck so i couldn't help but listen in she repeated talking points and antidotes from on the news the re professor responded with calm scientific facts about incubation periods and methods of transmission i was surprised the overachiever some XASB, AP student in high school type would be so nonsensical and irrational about all this. Maybe all the studying backfired and made her unprepared for the real world. But I merely shrugged, sat down, exchanged pleasantries with my teacher. Now, a little background about the Ebola virus disease. Basically, it's a virus that gives you some fever and some sores and some pains. Eventually, that leads to vomiting, diarrhea, rashes, which will roll into some internal bleeding, liver failure, death, all that good stuff. Point is, it comes from a brown person country and it's at least 25% fatal, so that makes for a hysteria more contagious amongst Americans and the media than the actual disease. I, I myself don't get out of bed for anything less than a 60% mortality rate, so I wasn't tripping. <laughs> I assumed we had a lecture about primates because there was only so many topics it could be and I was quickly about to enter nap time before my shift at Vans Plaza Bonita. When I returned from dreamland, class was near ending. As usual, a test was coming up and preparation was encouraged, but I'm not even sure I owned the textbook for this class, so a solid C minus would have to do for me. My class was prepared to shuffle off to their next one, but something was blocking our way. Outside the door was a barrier of yellow police tape. In fact, yellow police tape covered the entire small plaza outside of our class and the other classrooms surrounding it. Curious, I thought, we heard no sirens or police activity. We saw no evidence of a crime scene either. Another class across the way, too, that suffered the same fate. They looked just as puzzled as we were, so it didn't seem like they were responsible for any of this. If you looked out of the plaza towards the wide open slaps of campus, there was 
no one around, empty. We decided to settle back into the classroom while the professor phoned the administration to see what was going on. Immediately, speculation began. What could possibly be the, reigning, the reason for our detaining? This is America, so naturally, active shooter could be the thirst thought, but no gunshot sounds? And how would they get police tape up so fast and efficiently if they were under fire? Terrorist activity or bomb threat were other possibilities, but still, this was autumn 2014, so naturally a certain disease began to leak into the conversation. Our professor's attempts to find an explanation with campus officials were unsuccessful. It seemed no one on campus would tell her what was going on. I looked around and I could tell by the more serious tone of the conversations taking place, there was a sudden sense of tension taking hold of the class. One of the students, older, usually more talkative, prone to tangents, began to sermonize about all the unusual. I always got bugged by their annoying non sequitur spiels about nonsense to feed their ego. Really, you get one like this in any non-math class, and I was worried this was the, exactly the situation that would allow them to rise into power, like that one crazy Christian lady in that Stephen King movie about the people <laughs> trapped in the grocery store. <laughs> now, by this point, we were supposed to be in our next classes. I was getting texts from peers in creative writing because I was supposed to be workshopping my last vamp, but I was nowhere to be found. Others begin to turn to social media in search of answers, in my case, just to document the confusion on Snapchat. At first, there's nothing, situation normal, on social media. That did nothing to squell our speculation, however, and the E word continued to get tossed around the class. A couple of class clowns in the back paid little attention. Instead, they goofed off. Though their antics aren't as loud and outrageous as they would have been in high school, it's nice to have a little levity as things are getting stranger by the second for the rest of the class. It didn't take long to see what was going on. Other Southwestern students had noticed a small section of campus is completely off limits. On social media, status and tweets were posted about teachers mentioning a possible Ebola exposure. The professor had left to the back room to try and make more phone calls to the campus officials. We peered out of the windows and saw reporters from the school paper taking photo and video of the quarantine zone. I turned back to my phone. My social circle sees my Snapchat in a wave of, are you all right? And what the fuck is happening, dudes? Come pouring in. One of my colleagues from creative writing began a hashtag prayers for veto campaign <laughs> that took hold on Facebook. She's here tonight. Uh, like a Greek choir, everyone chimed in. With jokes, concern, or nervous mixture of both. Some <laughs> high school friends who had moved away bragged about their distance from all the mess. Well, the ones who stayed local displayed a bit more concern. The overachiever was now visibly shaken. The class clowns even showed small signs of concern, while the older, more talkative student continued to sermonize about how much more they knew than the administration about to anything than to any two classmates that would listen. It's starting to sink in. I wonder, could this be real? I wonder if I'm still dreaming from my nap earlier in the class. You'd never imagine this kind of thing could ever happen to you. Never in my life did I think I'd be quarantined like in some science fiction picture show. Back on social media, the Ebola story is really starting to take hold. Tales of a student violently projectile vomiting onto a professor start to emerge. <laughs> my stream of concerned messages continue to pour in. People wanted to know if I was okay. They want to know what's going on. Maybe because I think they're wondering if they'll be okay. I swear that hashtag prayers for veto must be trending at this point. <laughs> All we can do is peer out the window. It's clear now local news has joined the school paper. Something is definitely going on. Our professor again emerges from the back room with no new information other than an email has been sent out, so we <laughs> crowd her as she slowly and professionally walks over to her computer at the podium to check her email. And that's when we saw it, the impossible unimaginable truth. A campus bigwig has set out a notice. A student was believed to be in contact with someone who was hospitalized for Ebola-like symptoms. Now, I know what you're thinking in the sober light of day, I guess not so sober right now, but <laughs> that this is ridiculous, vague innuendo. But as vague as this was to all of us in the class, it sounded like a death sentence. More news teams stood outside now, and I realized my death is going to be documented on live television. I cursed the overachiever. 
This must be her fault for talking about it earlier in the day. She jinxed us all to this fate. Why couldn't she have written a better personal statement and gotten to UC Berkeley back in high school? <laughs> Eventually, a narrative took shape. It came out that the student's sister was a nurse on the same plane as one of the Ebola nurses who contracted the disease. In a panic, we all conjured up a collective hallucination of a team of CDC agents in all white quarantine gear escorting us out to tents in the parking lot like an ET for study. I was completely hollowed out inside. It felt like everything in my life had been insignificant. That I was going to end up burned in a mass grave or best case scenario, an old man on the History Channel recounting the millennium's first great plague to future generations. I couldn't believe that my entire life was leading up to a community college death. <laughs> why, why didn't I study harder in 11th grade so I could have gotten into SDSU? Why didn't I pick a major and transfer out earlier? I was convinced I would spend my 21st birthday in some sort of emergency refugee hospital they set up to contain the outbreak. What a cruel destiny to watch as your fate is sealed, minute by minute, in some nondescript community college classroom, the place where dreams are supposed to be launched, not crashed into the fucking ground. My stream of condolence messages had not slowed down because I had still been thoroughly documenting the whole situation like I was in Cloverfield or the Blair Witch Project. <laughs> I scanned around the classroom to see everyone, most everyone, on their phones. Maybe only 30 minutes had passed, but it could have been days if you measured time by the collective fear and anxiety. I just remember the overachiever, the jinx, the one who shouldn't even fucking be here, freaking out and soliciting assurances or panicked whispers from anyone in their direct vicinity. I scanned around some more, and in a moment of clarity, I noticed that the professor had turned to the back room to make some phone calls. And this time, I could tell she was getting some information. A clever student, level-headed and affiliated with the school paper, also noticed this, so we both decided to make our way over. Slowly, I walked over towards her. <laughs> I, I wanted to see what was going on. I needed answers, and I needed them now. I walked what must have been miles. I had to know my fate, but I just didn't want to know my fate. How bad was it? I was trying to read her face. It seemed vaguely annoyed, but I guess we all process our own mortality differently. <laughs> so slowly we walked over. We started to talk to her as she hung up the phone. And now, close up, we could tell by the look of her face that things had been blown way out of proportion. <laughs> you see, she was a biological anthropology teacher. She knew a thing or two about pathologies, and when she heard the full story the student gave, it became apparent that the symptoms and the time frame did not match up with the public knowledge of the Ebola nurse's travels or with the Ebola incubation period. It was also apparent that the student had missed a significant chunk of schoolwork and didn't have a valid documented excuse. <laughs> There was no explosive violent vomiting. There was never any disease. With that, slowly the panic around the classroom, the campus, even social media began to subside. My parents eventually caught on, but by then I had nothing for them but reassurances and nervous quips. Fear turned to jokes. People would expect this out of Southwestern College, the South Bay School, the Ratchet College. <laughs> they kept us quarantined for about five hours even though the hysteria must have been completely dissipated by hour 1.5. So we put on Netflix, we got shitty sandwiches and chips in the cafeteria. Despite the fact that the entire South Bay community was in a panic and the class clowns had completely escaped the quarantine altogether, to this day, I really don't know how. <laughs> the school still kept us 10 minutes longer to congratulate themselves on what a great job they did before releasing us. <laughs> and with that, I walked off rode onto my sunset of a cheap Lolita's California burrito, you guys know what I'm talking about, and a shift at the Vans in Plaza Bonita. It barely even came up at work that day. But you know, I, I think back to that burrito and how happy and relieved I was to be alive. <laughs> For months, whenever I mentioned I was from Southwestern College, the Ebola thing would come up. I spoke with a post-grad researcher who studied diseases, and he told me how his entire research team studied it, laughed at it for hours. 
When I went to a college party with some UCSD friends, they all quickly recognized my school as the Ebola school. <laughs> I could only grit my teeth and take it as a bunch of faded, nerdy, awkward UCSD students mocked the lowly college down the 805. <laughs> friends from high school who went away to school in San Francisco spoke divisively of our hometown. This is so Southwestern, they said. Oh. Months of humiliation eventually subsided. People just kind of forgot. After all, why would anyone remember anything that happened at Southwestern? I'm betting you all forgot too. I know my mom forgot. <laughs> I still remember though. I think back to my burrito that day, a burrito I can no longer enjoy due to my lactose intolerance, and I still remember all of those wild, previously unfelt feelings. And as dark as it got, I have to say I'm kind of glad. I think I'd rather live in the type of world where this thing fake happens as opposed to actually happens. If that means going to the South Bay School, so be it. Southwestern is just a place to transfer somewhere else. People still make it out of the community college quarantine. Every school has its slackers and scammers. <laughs> at, at, <laughs> at the end of the day, us community college students could end up at those respectable schools just as easily as fake Ebola could. Thank you. Vito Di Stefano.